Uh, I want to start by also saying thank you to the university and to you in particular for all the work you've done to get me here physically. Uh, I really do appreciate it. It's been a very interesting experience for me to be here and to interact with the students. I think it's a very original experience. I don't think many um, well, people in general, I think, get to come to Greenland and, and visit Greenland and also work at university. So I also want to thank you guys uh, for that. Yes, today I'm going to give you a very brief uh, and very general introduction to my PhD um, research. And I really look forward to your questions. We can elaborate on parts of it, uh, things that are not clear, or we can get into the more theoretical stuff, which I left out of the, the presentation here. Um, so let's get right to it, shall we? Let's go to Cape Town, all the way down south, on the tip of the African continent, located between the Atlantic Ocean on the one side and the Indian Ocean on the other side. Now, who of you have been to Cape Town? I know that Ibe went there, yes? Okay, you too, all right, interesting, yes. So, you would perhaps agree with me that on the one hand it is certainly a very beautiful city, right? You can see that from the picture here, um, but I would argue that it is in many ways a paradise in disguise. So the way to understand this is to imagine that you would be approaching Cape Town from the sea, from the oceans, and what you would see if you would do that, you would find these uh, beautiful neighborhoods, these lively uh, uh, suburbs, pubs, lavish beaches, iconic Table Mountain, the Flat Table Mountain, which is one of the wonders of the world, even though there are actually many Table Mountains across Africa, but that's for another time. You would find a rather beautiful city, but particularly if you would ma make your way sort of across the mountain, imagine going over um, the mountain, you would find a very different picture. Here you would find much less affluent neighborhoods, so-called townships, that houses the majority of the people that live in Cape Town. And these areas, although they can definitely greatly differ between them, there's a lot of differences between these areas, but in general, they're often hotbeds of criminal activity, which includes organized crime, alcoholism, drug abuse, sexual assault, domestic abuse, and sadly the list goes on for a while. This broad area behind the mountain, it's called the Cape Flats, often referred to as the Cape Flats, and the Cape Flats has one of the highest rates of murder per capita in the world. The murder rate got so out of control, mostly related to gang violence in this case, that the army actually had to patrol the streets there last year for about six months. And as you can see in this picture, which is part of a series of aerial photographs by Johnny Miller in 2016 to show the inequality in South Africa. South Africa competes with Brazil for the first place of one of the most unequal countries in the world, so inequality between rich and poor. You can see in this picture very starkly that there's a huge difference between these areas that can be located right next to one another. Uh, you can see the area on the right, uh, it has much better infrastructure, it seems much more affluent than the one to the left. And this is, this urban architecture is a legacy of apartheid in particular. Apartheid was the official policy in South Africa between 1948 and 1994. 1994, the famous year when Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress took over power and white minority rule came to an end. Very briefly, apartheid, it's an ideology of racial segregation. In apartheid, you are identified by birth as being a member of one of the four main racial groups that were distinguished. So you had whites, those were Europeans and European descendants or migrants, black, which was Bantu-speaking people, that's the majority demographic in the country today, by the way, Indian, I guess that explains a bit itself, and this term colored, which I'm going to get back to in just a moment. But what is important to understand is according to these labels, the racial identity that you were assigned, you were allowed to live in certain areas, but not in others. You were allowed to carry out certain jobs, but not others. You were allowed to have intimate relationships, marry people, but not others. So race, it really dominated everyday life in apartheid. 
And these racial categories were, of course, placed in a hierarchy where white people sat on top and got all the privileges, and black people were put on the lower end of the scale. And Indians and coloreds were somehow in between, somewhat of a middle ground. Although I can already say that this colored group, the privileges it did get over black people, nothing came close to the privileges that white people got. And that is what you see in this picture still today, right? This is more than 25 years after 1994, you can still see that there's a very stark difference in the living conditions, even after apartheid has been abolished for 25 years. But even if these legacies are still very, very visible, and you can't miss them when you're in South Africa, um, but they're still very visible today, it doesn't mean that the ANC government hasn't done its best to try and undo these legacies. Huh? And just to mention two ways, probably the most, um, well, prominent ways it has tried to do this. Truth and reconciliation on the one hand and land reform. Uh, talking about reconciliation, this picture here of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was the first hearing in East London. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the idea behind it, and it was chaired by the uh, charismatic Archbishop Desmond Tutu here in the in the purple dress there. It ran between 1995 and 1998. And the idea of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was, let us, instead of enacting vengeance on the perpetrators, let them, let's give them an opportunity to publicly come forward and confess and tell to the victims, apologize to the victims, and tell them what happened to, 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 to their families and to the people that um, that, that, that got killed or faced all sorts of abuses. And in exchange for that, the um, perpetrators would then get amnesty. That was the idea behind the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yeah. When it comes to land reform, so the reason being that one of the policies of apartheid was, of course, to distribute land unequally among these racial groups and white people in 1913 got 87% of the land in South Africa. Even while they constituted at that time, it must have been around 8% of the people in the country. So 8% got 87% mm -hmm. of the land and also the best parts of the land, the most productive parts of the land. So to undo this situation, the NC government implemented this policy of land reform. On the one hand, they bought land uh, from people that were willing to sell it, and then they redistributed it to um, people that didn't have land or were dispossessed of land, and mostly people that are classified black. That's one part of it. The second part of it is land claims. So there was a program between 1995 and 1998, parallel to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where people could, if they could prove that they were raci racially motivated dispossessed, so they were dispossessed because of racially motivated reasons, they could put in a claim and potentially get back their land. But they could only go back to 1913. Yeah? And as you can see from this picture here, which is of the Economic Freedom Fighters Party, which is a party that is growing quite rapidly in South Africa. I think it got 10% of the vote in the last election which is a lot in South African politics compared to the ANC, which got 55%, I think, still today. Um, this is a very emotive issue. I take back the land. Land is probably one of the most contentious issues in South Africa today. So for all these reasons, you don't have to look far to understand why South Africans remain strongly preoccupied with the history of apartheid, right? The, the legacies are so visibly still there. There's so much work still need to be Still, uh, that still needs to be done. Same thing with the research on South Africa. The research on South Africa still very much focuses on apartheid. And if people think about South Africa, they often think about relationships between and conflicts between whites and blacks. But however important the history of apartheid still is to South Africa today, and it would be absurd to argue that it isn't, and however morally imperative, so however morally important it is to undo these legacies, the history of colonialism in South Africa cannot and should not, and this is the words of my, one of my informants here, this history of colonialism cannot be started in the middle. 
because there's a group, if you do that, that gets left out, many groups actually, but the group I'm focusing on today, there's a group that gets left out in these debates, and those are the Khoisan. Because indeed, the history of colonial conquest in South Africa, it has to be brought back, brought back to the mid 17th century with the arrival of the Dutch colonial official Jan van Riebeek here at the center of this painting, this 19th century painting by Samuel Bell. It has to be brought back to this man and the people that came with him and the establishment of a permanent structure on the shores of Table Bay in Cape Town in 1652. So while European traders they had been stopping at the Cape, calling at the Cape for a long time to engage in trade with the local Khoisan, so for about half a century before and even longer, they had never set up a permanent structure there. So they came and they went. Now for reasons that I'm not going to get into here, in 1652 they decided to create a permanent structure, which is still in Cape Town today, which is called the Castle of Good Hope. Good Hope, it's a reference to the sailors, the first sailors, Diaz and Da Gama, who rounded the Cape, and they had good hopes of reaching the Indian subcontinent to engage in trade there, and thereby avoid going over the land route to India between Europe and the Indian subcontinent. That's just to clarify it. The Castle of Good Hope. But for the indigenous inhabitants, this establishment spelled nothing like good hope. In fact, quite the opposite. It meant that Dutch colonialism would permanently settle and expand on its shores. And soon, conflicts would break out between the settlers and the Khoisan. The Khoisan had been living there for at least two centuries in that specific part of uh, uh, South Africa I'm talking about, um, as semi-nomadic. So they were moving and sometimes settling. So a combination of both semi-nomadic cattle herders and hunter-gatherers. And you can see here in this picture um, the various names of the, the tribes that were here. So if you come from uh, Little Namakoland and then you keep going down all the way east until you encounter the Kosa in the Eastern Cape next to the, the, the Fish River or the, the Kay River. So in a series of wars which followed this expansion of settlers into the interior, eastward and northward into the interior. The Khoisan, they were dispossessed by the settlers of their land, and the settlers established farms on those lands. And many Khoisan also died in resistance campaigns against these settlers, but also because of smallpox epidemics that uh, the Europeans brought over to the area, and the Khoisan weren't that resistance too. So this colonial frontier kept on pushing into, uh, in, into the South African interior until eventually it would end up engulfing the whole of South Africa and settlers would be found all over the country. Now, what is very important to understand here is when the time the British took over the colony at the beginning of the 19th century and they began their own series of violent confrontations with the Bantu-speaking peoples along the eastern frontier, so the Klosa I mentioned earlier on the eastern frontier, these people, the Bantu-speaking peoples, they had arrived after the Khoisan. They have many similarities, but also many, many differences in culture, in language, and so on with the Khoisan. So the Khoisan, in many ways, they had undergone a different colonization process by that time. The Bantu would have a different, in many ways at least, a very different colonial process. Now, let me clarify, that doesn't mean in the least that the Bantu-speaking people didn't suffer greatly or that they weren't treated in extremely violent ways. Again, that would be another absurd statement to make. But if you study these conflicts between settlers and indigenous peoples across the world, you would find that, at least in many cases, there are, distinct, there are distinctions between their historical trajectories with colonialists. Which means, because these histories are different, we need to think about their contemporary legacies in different ways as well, but I'll get to that in a second. So, the Bantu-speaking majority and the Bantu-speaking groups, for instance, the idea behind their conquest wasn't to assimilate them into colonial society so much. In apartheid, they were placed into so-called Bantustans or homelands. Maybe you've, you've heard of that. And in the idea of housing them or 
forcefully, of course, removing them from the Arabs and locating them in these Bantu stands. The idea was that there, the Bantu could practice their culture, as the colonials defined it. So even if the colonialists really defined Bantu culture and what was allowed to be practiced under those circumstances, there was never an attempt to destroy Bantu culture and identity, to erase it from the landscape. Again, they were discriminated against, they experienced horrible violence, but the ideas motivating that violence were different. So what happened to the Khoisan instead? What's the difference with the Khoisan? Well, in this case, the colonial forces absolutely tried to destroy and suppress Khoisan identity. Essentially, in this process of colonialism, the Khoisan were either forced to flee further inland, to put up a fight, and then eventually be killed, or to be assimilated into colonial society, but not on their own terms, of course, but on the terms of the colonial society. The colonialists said, okay, you can join our society, but you will be baptized as Christians, and you cannot practice your indigenous cu uh, culture. Uh, the first missionaries in South Africa were the Moravians. Only when the British came did the London Missionary Society come, and this is a picture of one of those mission stations in the Western Cape, but they're all over. So you couldn't speak your indigenous language anymore, you had to speak, maybe it's a bit anachronistic to say, but what is today Afrikaans, so a, a sort of Creole version of Dutch. You had to practice Christian culture, you had to work on the farm as a laborer in conditions that are not completely different actually from the slaves that were brought over to work on those farms. So if you weren't explicitly killed by the colonial forces, any connection to the Khoisan among these descendants was severed, it was deliberately and violently erased. And this is where the colored category comes in, because eventually the colored, uh, sorry, the Khoisan alongside also many other groups, they became assimilated in this racial group that the colonials defined as colored. And colored is a very vaguely defined group in particular. It is very uh, hard to define it because all sorts of demographics were actually put into this category. So there were the Khoisan, the Khoisan descendants, they were put into the category of colored, but also slaves and children of mixed unions. So unions between Europeans and Khoisan, Europeans and slaves, Europeans and Bantu speakers. They were placed into this category. Remember the hierarchy, so they occupied this sort of middle rung. And this is also, of course, something that you see in many uh, colonial societies, that there's this sort of mixed race group being defined in society. Now there's a debate that says that this label, this identity label colored was also really given shape to from, from below, from the people themselves. I, I don't really want to get into that debate here, but I do want to raise it because some people argue that it was also sort of an identity from below. So, the process of assimilating the Khoisan, this took place over centuries. But the explicit suppression of Khoisan identity across this time, across this process that spanned centuries, was really that it, it, it ended up with this larger idea, this notion that was really very, very shared in South Africa uh, at the time and still today, in fact, that the Khoisan therefore had died out as a distinct collective. And they weren't really there anymore, they were extinct. And what's important to appreciate is that this idea that the Khoisan weren't really there anymore, that their culture died out, that the people died out, it was internalized by Khoisan descendants as well. And this is very important to, to understand because the colonial forces did everything, remember this assimilation policy, to suppress that identity, to make sure that this um, connection to indigenous belonging was completely severed. So in apartheid, if you would have asked people in Cape Town about their identities, they would have surely publicly, at the very least, never said, I'm Khoisan or I have Khoisan roots. Instead, uh, apartheid ideology make sure, made sure that you would emphasize, again, at least publicly, your European ancestors. You would adopt Western ways and you would play European, basically. <laughs> 
And in the colonial mindset, this was considered a positive development, or at least sort of an in, in, uh, inevitable development, a sort of side effect of modernization, if you will. And you can see this here from this striking quote from the colonial writer John Barrow in 1801, who writes about the Khoisan, these weak people, the most helpless, and in their present condition, perhaps the most wretched of the human race, duped out of their possessions, their country, and finally out of their liberty, have entailed upon their miserable offspring a state of existence to which that of slavery might bear the comparison of happiness. Wow. The name Hottentots, Hottentots, that's a very derogatory name that the colonials gave to uh, Khoisan descendants. The name Hottentots will be forgotten or remembered only as that of a diseased person of little note. I like to put this quote in my presentations because as you'll see in a moment, that's definitely not what turned out to have happened. But for the colored, this idea of colored, and many also still think, think about this in, 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 in these sort of terms, in a moment there was this idea that they're a mixed group. They're this group that doesn't have a real identity, doesn't have a real sense of belonging, uh, a real past to be proud of, yeah, a highly ambiguously defined in the words of this uh, apartheid politician, sort of a, a leftover group, a negative group, a non-person, the people that were left out after the nations were sorted out, the rest. And as for the Khoisan that did perhaps still exist in some way, people would often imagine pictures like this, set in the northern stretches of the Kalahari Desert across southern Africa, living out a sort of pristine life as, uh, as hunter-gatherers according to traditional, or what I, or what I consider to be by some their traditional ways of life. Uh, this image, I took it from a website from a tourist, uh, one of the many tourist sites in, um, in the Northern Cape. But except for perhaps these survivors of the Stone Age, and this is actually what some of the websites use to still refer to them today, uh, Besides from perhaps these sort of pockets that are eventually on their way out also because of modernization, because of colonialism, there was this idea that the, the Khoisan had actually vanished, that they weren't really there, and that their culture had simply died out, particularly in cities. But yet today, and this is where my research really comes in, one would find that it is in cities that you find the most vibrant embrace of Khoisan identity and culture in the place where, as one of my informants put it, the place where the bomb of colonialism first fell, Cape Town. In fact, in this picture here on your left-hand side, you see them standing away just meters from the Castle of Good Hope that I showed you in a minute. This was at a protest on International Indigenous Peoples Day in 2017, uh, which I'll get back to in a moment. So here in Cape Town in particular, but elsewhere as well, people are ditching their identities as colored and they're embracing their, their new identity as Khoisan, indigenous Khoisan. That's why you would often hear the slogan that I put here, Khoisan forever, colored never. And this process has been referred to as the Khoisan revival by the informants themselves, but also by researchers. And we can discuss about this term revival because it has upsides and downsides. The, the downside of using a term like revival would be that it has connotations that indigenous culture did die at some point and that not now it is brought back to life. That would be the downside, I suppose. And for me, at least, this is not a point that I, do, uh, I want to make. I, want to, I don't want to endorse this idea that the culture died and now it's back. But at the same time, well, I use it on the one hand because my informants use it, but also because it does capture the destructive processes of colonialism that you can't ignore, neither. The drive that was there to erase that culture on the one hand, and then today, this really vibrant effort to get the culture back uh, in, 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 in all its vibrancy. So, but the questions that I began to ask when I first learned of these revivalists, these Khoisan revivalists, which to my surprise, few academics had actually written about, cared to write about, wasn't whether or not these people were the real deal or whether it was correct to write them Khoisan or Neo-Khoisan as some people call them, 
or any of these sorts of questions. I personally think it's a rather arrogant academic enterprise to sort of police people's identities and to really try to figure out if they're the real thing, yes or no. Rather, I wanted to go for fieldwork in Cape Town to understand why it is that these Khoisan revivalists would revisit their heritage and start calling themselves Khoisan. What was it about that identity and that history that appealed to them in the present moment? And that's why I did ethnographic fieldwork in Cape Town. Uh, right now, I think I'm, I'm, I have one and a half year um, of different periods of fieldwork in Cape Town. I wanted to get their perspective on things. And if you would Google Khoisan revivalism or the, you would try to understand what the media is writing about, you'd mostly get to issues of land and traditional leadership. You would mostly get to the political domain. And this was also made clear at this protest here at the Castle of Good Hope. And they feel that their grievances aren't taken seriously by the current government. They say that the current government, the post-apartheid government, is in many ways continuing their discrimination that was pursued by colonial governments that went before them, apartheid and the centuries before. They feel that their story is really drowned out in this wider narrative of black versus white, where they feel they have no place or they're actually being explicitly ignored. Because in South Africa, although there's no official definition of the term, indigenous, it's obvious that it's referring to all African groups in the country. So if you are descendant from an African group, whether it's Khoisan or a Bantu-speaking group, you essentially count as indigenous. And the idea behind it is probably that, or clearly actually, that if you would, well, the fear is that if you would call one group indigenous and the other one not, that that would incite violence and uh, one group would feel more privileged than another group. That's the idea behind the government's decision. But for the Khoisan, it's actually not, that's not what I find at the very least. It's not about getting more privileges than another group. It's more that in this narrative of everybody is equal, that their specific historical and contemporary predicaments are eclipsed. And I can show this to you if you look at the two most pronounced issues in Khoisan revivalist politics, land and traditional leadership. I can show you how they feel that they are left out of the narrative. When you talk about land claims, the Khoisan revivalists, they campaign for scrapping that cut-off date of 1913. Remember I told you that you could claim back land, but only going back to 1913. And as I've just shown you, the Khoisan, of course, they've lost their lands centuries before that already. So they feel unjustly excluded from this process of land claims. Moreover, they don't have title deeds. They don't have written documents from the 17th century proving that they were occupying this specific piece of land. Uh, there was no conception, really, of private property at the time. So it's unjust, they feel, to require them to produce the same kind of documentation as others have to produce in this apartheid-focused land reform process. When it comes to traditional leadership, so in South Africa after 1994, many traditional leaders were officially recognized by the post-apartheid government. And although these are mostly ceremonial roles that these traditional leaders occupy, they do play an important symbolic role in society. They get salaries from the government and they're consulted on new legislation and things like that. But again, the difference is here that the, when the, the, the Bantu-speaking people, because of different historical trajectories, they could prove that uh, historical continuity going into the past more easily than the Khoisan, who had faced much more um, pervasive forces of destruction. So they couldn't prove this historical continuity going back all the way until the 17th century. Eh? They couldn't prove that they practiced the culture still in, 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 in more or less the same ways as that time, eh? because a, a, a lot of things, of course, happened in the meantime. So that's an example of how they're drawn out in the narrative. But then again, uh, the core of Khoisan revivalism, it cannot and it should not be brought back to politics as such. To understand the identity, I think, you have to take a more psychological type of view. You have to appreciate the various facets that make up a person's being 
And for me, I'm very interested in how history in particular features in identity construction. So the, the, the following quote for me, it's particularly insightful. It comes from a man called Zenzile Khoisan. He changed his name from Charles Jackson to Zenzile Khoisan to highlight his Khoisan roots. And he's a very uh, brilliant, I think, rhetorician. He also set up a newspaper that's only altered by Khoisan revivalists that really helped to get the message out. So he's a very interesting person um, to work with, and I was happy that I got the opportunity to do so. So he says, in reference to this destructive history of colonialism and the urgent need to craft meaningful identities in the present, in the present, he says, the history of our people has been lost, stolen, strayed and distorted, and now as a resurgent nation, rising from our valley of dry bones, where we must knit together a cohesive story of who we are as a people, where we come from, and who we are now. It is the story of our existence, our travails, and our triumphs. This is our cohesive narrative that must be sensitively put together as we chart our pathway to a future where we are recognized and historic, restored. Sorry. But what I like about this uh, quote is that he says that indigenous identity, it's not a matter of uncritically sort of copy-pasting from the past. It's not a matter of mimicking history, of turning back the clock. He clearly sees identity as an opportunity to knit together these cohesive stories of where people belong, of who they are. And I think it's incredibly important to understand the process of indigenous revivalism as these are processes happening in the present. And one aspect of such a process of indigenous revival, of course, is to explicitly counter the narrative that they are no longer there, that their culture has no relevance for the present. This can involve practices of naming areas and places after their original indigenous names. So Khoisan revivalists, for instance, they don't speak of Cape Town, but they speak of Kui Ayab to highlight the fact that it has an indigenous presence for a long time, long before the Europeans came. So if you want to help them out, you won't speak of Cape Town anymore, you would speak of Kui Ayab. Same thing with the iconic Table Mountain, one of the city's well-known tourist attractions, and as I said, one of the official wonders of the world. As you can see from this sign here, they say, no, we shouldn't talk about Table Mountain, we should call Huricuaco, which is the mountain rising from the sea. That's the proper indigenous name. And as you can tell from this sign, these efforts are not without uh, effects. So this is a sign that uh, shows this, and if you go up on Table Mountain, there's a little bit of explanation, but it's kind of misleading because there's not a lot of this happening, but it is an interesting example. It's a start, I suppose, but not a lot of this is happening. But the meaning of an indigenous past for Khoisan revivalists, it's also highlighted in everyday life. It becomes a way of looking at life, your life, other people's lives, the world around you, with a lens that spans centuries not just what happened yesterday or in your family, but way beyond that. It becomes a way of rooting your identity and belonging on an entirely different level. Particularly if you would remember that people living in these areas, they got this label colored, many of them at least, they got this label colored, and there was this emphasis that you're actually a non-person, you don't have a history, you don't have a real identity, um, you're sort of this leftover person. So there's a direct counter to that narrative, of course. And I like to illustrate this with the Greco Museum. The Greco are a subgroup of the Khoisan. Uh, I'm not going to get into that here. Um, so, and anyway, it's a, it's a museum that says much more than, than just the Greco. It is about the Khoisan in general. And this museum was set up uh, by a prominent uh, activist in uh, actually a, a pretty bad neighborhood of, of Cape Town, Leonisdale, close to Ilse's River. And as you can see from this uh, picture, on the one hand, you can see that the museum, uh, it's set up with sort of modest funds. And you can also see the tower blocks uh, on, the, on, the, on the left side. These are social housing blocks. And they are particularly notorious for being 
areas where there are very bad social conditions and a lot of a lot of uh, violence. Uh, so they really be it came to symbolize uh, this uh, d d these dynamics. So it's it's an interesting juxtaposition uh, of the museum on the one side and the tower blocks on the other hand. Because why is it? Because the museum it taps into this idea that the root of these social issues, these social ills, this crime, this violence. It's to be found in a lack of identity, of course, a lack of connecting to Khoisan identity more precisely, because you are labeled colored, and that's the only way you know yourself. And with this museum, and this museum, it houses a small collection of Khoisan items and information about their history and culture, uh, historical figures that resisted colonialism, and so on. The idea is that people in the neighborhood, and particularly school children that are still uh, young and learning about these things, that they would discover a sense of belonging and identity, a sense of belonging and identity that would instill them a sense of pride and belonging, not this kind of nihilism that would come from being known as colored, not having a history to be proud of, um, and perhaps looking for these signs of belonging in a life of crime uh, instead and I will not get, get into this in, in detail, but if you study organized uh, crime, whether it's in South Africa or the Mafia in Italy, you would find that these organizations are not just uh, ways to exploit and get money, but also provide actually a, a, a type of culture, a type of identity. They use particular symbols. Huh? So there's a lot of research in South Africa trying to understand the appeal of gangs also from this perspective, uh, people looking for sources of identity as well. And this is a detail here, you can see it uh, on the other picture as well. This is a detail of the museum on the front. And it's really a sort of imagination, I suppose, of what uh, the pre-colonial life could look like. And it's, in, in my view at least, it's meant to get people to imagine how things could be different, um, of course, could have been different at the very least if things maybe stayed in that same way and the culture was still around. So this is really, uh, again, this stark contrast between the, the, the harsh living conditions um, that they have to endure and uh, this uh, Khoisan past. You can see this also very much with the figure of Kratoa. Kratoa, she's a 17th century Khoisan woman. She acted as an interpreter, a kind of translator between the Dutch colonialists and the Khoisan. She translated between them, and she lived uh, most of her adult life with the Dutch colonialists. She also married a Danish surgeon called Van Meerhof, Johan Van Meerhof, I think. Um, and for a long time, there wasn't really a lot of interest in uh, Kritoa. There was this, okay, this is this random f uh, uh, sort of a figure uh, in history. She didn't have a lot of agency. And many people also thought that she was a kind of traitor to her own people, actually, because she worked with the Dutch people. So there wasn't a lot of attention in classic historiography about her. And if there was, it wasn't in a good light. But the Khoisan revivalists, of course, they have been attracted to retell her story in a different way, to relate to her story in a very different way in recent years. And you can really see that with no other figure than with Kratoa in particular, how it is that these historical figures are made to be relevant in the present. So many people choose to identify with her and her story. I'll give an example of this in a moment, but there's this campaign currently underway to rename Cape Town International Airport Kratoa International Airport. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be successful probably because, again, there's a very strong force behind renaming it Nelson Mandela Airport instead. instead. And maybe you remember Ibe that on the money, or, or you have been there as well, that on the money, every money, there's Nelson Mandela on all, all, the, all the bills. So just to show you that, of course, I'm not against Nelson Mandela, but to show you that the country is definitely still very much focused on apartheid and anti-apartheid, on the period of apartheid. So one of the reasons why Kratoa is approached and spoken of so much yeah, is because I've told you there's a high degree of substance abuse in so-called colored communities. And Kratoa, it's historically documented, she also became an alcoholic as her kids were taken away from her in the last years of her life. So for many Khoisan revivalists today, this story, it resonates 
with them. It's sort of a sign of what, of, of what was to come in the centuries after that in terms of the substance abuse, the, the, har the harmful effects that alcohol would have on their lives. As I said, she married this Danish surgeon. She got kids uh, with him, several children. And this too is seen as the first, at least the first documented um, instance of a Khoisan woman having children with a European man. And the idea is that these children also face a lot of stigmas because of that in their later lives. Although they weren't labeled colored at the time, they would eventually, their offspring then, of course, would be labeled colored. So the idea is that these people, they underwent the same kind of stigmas, the same lack of identity as we have today. So there's a lot of meaning to find in that story. It's not just this figure on the sidelines of history that didn't play a big role. And I could give many other examples, but uh, in the interest of time, I did just want to note that this is a, a very interesting figure, I think, that's being talked about. And also, not just by the Khoisan, by the way, also by others. Uh, that's why I put up this, this other uh, poster here. It's a movie uh, about, about her life. Um, but Khoisan revivalists actually really hate it because, well, I will not get into the reasons why, but let me just say that I would agree with them that there's an awkward sort of pro-colonialist narrative going on in the movie. So this history is, of course, also contested in the public domain. That's the point I want to make, I guess. Now, what is, of course, important to understand is that Khoisan revivalism and, of course, indigenous revivalism in general is not just about showing the dispossession, uh, the lack, the loss. There's also uh, the damaging impact of colonialism. It's not just about that. It's also about, of course, presenting a positive message. And I do want to illustrate this with this example here of this company called Koi Culture. It was set up by mm. Roche Walters. He's a Koi son from the Eastern Cape who moved to Cape Town as I was doing my field work and I had a lot of chats with him. Very interesting man, I think. And the idea behind this company is to repackage Khoisan culture in a 21st century jacket. In Rocher's own words, it's to make it cool and hip. And he believes that this way, this way of presenting the culture or relating to indigenous identity, to reviving the Khoisan culture, that this is actually what will make it survive. Because as he simply said it, people will still be wearing these clothes in the future. So for him, the culture doesn't necessarily have to be old or according to ancient ways necessarily. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. It can certainly be presented rather in this modern interpretation. And the idea is that through this kind of uh, symbols, clothing, you get the youth involved in particular. So he sells t-shirts, he sells hats, he sells cheese, socks, shoes, and you can keep going on with Khoisan, this kind of, kind of Khoisan imagery, but also with this semi-political Khoisan revivalist messages on them, right? Embrace your roots, live original. So I think for me at least, what Roche's company, what Khoi culture, it does or what it reminds us of is that we do well to appreciate that Khoisan culture is not for us or me as an academic to place borders on. It's not for us to say, okay, this is Khoisan culture. Particularly not if you take an outdated or a colonialist type of view on what indigenous authenticity looks like. If you compare it to what your idea of an authentic history might be. Uh, Roche doesn't really care about this type of authenticity. You know, or if he uses romanticized versions of the past, he's just simply not really bothered by that. Uh, what matters to him is what is meaningful to him. What to him is a way of relating to Khoisan identity. So it's for the Khoisan revivalists themselves to have the freedom to display the culture and identity in the way they see it. I'd like to end with this picture. It's not the best quality, so forgive me for that, but I do think it inadvertently actually illustrates very much the kind of challenge that Khoisan revivalists or Khoisan revivalism poses to contemporary South African society. 
The picture is taken outside of the union buildings in Pretoria, which is the well, one of the seats of government. Uh, the, the office of the president is there. And the statue that you see is Nelson Mandela. And the, the, the symbolism of the statue is that Nelson Mandela is welcoming the diverse groups in South African society into the new uh, reconciled South African nation. But if, as you see, there are these tents placed behind Nelson Mandela. And in these tents, since 2017, there's been, and still today as we speak, there are Khoisan activists in those tents campaigning for indigenous rights and re being recognized as indigenous people. And it seems almost, one would have to ask them, I suppose, if that they put their tents behind Nelson Mandela to highlight the fact that they're excluded from this welcoming gesture from South African society today. Uh, it highlights the complexity of these different historical legacies of oppression in South Africa society today and how there's more to the history uh, to this history of oppression and the history of apartheid. When people ask me, how many people are we talking about here when you talk about Khoisan revivalists? I cannot give you a precise figure, I cannot give you a number really, but it's certainly clear that more and more people are reviving this identity and this culture. It's definitely on the rise and they're becoming more and more politically assertive, which means that they're also more and more harder to ignore by the South African government. So as Khoisan revivalism becomes more and more of a factor, it's important that you understand why it is that Khoisan revivalists are appealing to the past and identifying as Khoisan. Why are they doing it? It's not an obvious question and it's not an obvious answer as it might seem. A process of indigenous revivalism, it's not about turning back the clock. It's not about copy-pasting uncritically or opportunistically, for that matter, from the past. I think it's a, it's a strong mistake to limit a process to this kind of dynamics. I think it's vital that we do not just see this as an opportunistically or maliciously designed attempt to get rights over other people by claiming this indigenous status. Again, in my experience, talking to these people, interacting with them all these years, this is not what Khoisan revivalism is about. So what is it about? Well, I guess you would have to ask themselves and give them platforms to express their opinions, because that is not something that's really happening, it's starting to happen. There's a new Khoisan study center, the first one in the world in Cape Town last year, but if you would ask me, I would say, well, it's first and foremost about acknowledging the fact that the Khoisan, they have this different historical trajectory, at least in many ways, from other groups in South African society, which in turn, uh, as I said in the beginning, requires that you appreciate the legacy of this history in a different way as well. It's about looking further than apartheid. If you remember the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it focused on 1960, 1994, so it's only a small part of um, that past. It's about acknowledging the indigenous belonging of Khoisan revivalists. It's about designing ways of recognition and reparations that speak to their specific issues, not just using blanket uh, policies to deal with them. It's about ditching an outdated colonial interpretation of authenticity when you look at these expressions of course on revivalism. It's about all these things and much, much more. It's in a nutshell, I would say, about being meaningfully included as an equal partner in the conversation about South Africa's future and the relationship of South Africa with its past. And the longer this is ignored, the longer this is dealt with in inappropriate or insensitive ways, the less these people will be willing to associate with the South African nation building project. And that definitely doesn't benefit anybody. So I come to an end now. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your uh, questions and feedback. Thank you.